The following program is paid for by the ministry partners of the Hour of Power and viewers like you. Friends, would you hold your hands out like this as a way of receiving from the Lord? Let's say this together. I'm not what I do. I'm not what I have. I'm not what people say about me. I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it from me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to hurry. I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with the world. Thanks, you can have a seat. I want you to know, um, as we finish the series on winning the worry war, you know, we've basically been saying the same thing, and today I'm gonna sort of cap it off with what it means to be Paschal, the Paschal mystery, and I'm gonna look at it through the philosophical lens of Nicholas Taleb, the idea of the anti-fragile. We're gonna explain all of that. But first, if you hear anything, I want you to know today that if Christ is in you, you are a lot stronger than you know. In your baptism, you are giving, given something that is utterly limitless in its power. And I want you this morning to discover what that means in your life, particularly when little things or big things that, that feel like deaths uh, happen, what that actually does in your life, and why you can stop worrying today about what's going to happen tomorrow. Jesus tells us this. In the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 6, one of the most famous parts of the Sermon on the Mount, one of my favorite parts, uh, he says, uh, but seek first, what? His kingdom and his righteousness, then what? All these things will be given to you as well. All these things he's talking about are you know, health issues, material issues, opportunities, etc. Every Bible scholar, as uncomfortable as it is to read that, would agree that the context of this passage is that when you seek first his righteousness, you'll have everything you need, your daily bread. And then he goes on to say, therefore, everybody say therefore. Remember what Ed Stetzer la said last week? When you see a therefore, you need to know what it's there for, right? <laughs> therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. I don't know about you, but when I read that, don't worry about tomorrow, it sounds nice, but when I try to do it, it's really hard. <laughs> Especially if I'm going through a hard time. How do you just... Not, it's really hard to not do something, especially when it comes to thinking. Like if I told all of you, don't think of a purple elephant, <laughs> right? It's the classic example. Don't think about what a purple elephant would look like. Don't picture it having a sombrero on. <laughs> you know, don't picture it standing on its hind legs, doing a macarena. Everybody, it's like, okay, I'm trying really hard. <laughs> so when Jesus says, don't worry, he's basically saying, don't think about the certain thing, but he, that passage is not standalone. It's built on the passage that precedes it. That if we seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, we don't need to worry about tomorrow. And this is at the heart of what it means to live a worry-free life. There is no way to just choose to like stop worrying all the time, especially if you know, you're in a bad, bad spot, you know? If you're in a war zone, how do you just not worry, you know? If, you, if you've got kids, how do you not worry, you know? And the answer is basically this, that we have to discover within ourselves the Paschal mystery, which I'll get to in a second. We have to stop trying to figure out what's going to happen tomorrow, because even though tomorrow is known by God, it cannot be known by us. And so we experience the world as chaos, the worst things that have ever happened to people, they didn't see it coming. When we base the worst thing that can happen tomorrow based on the worst thing that happened yesterday, that's also a mistake in risk management. So first of all, we have to just understand we will never be able to predict all the horrible, terrible things that are gonna happen tomorrow. And we're also gonna be unable to predict all the wonderful, marvelous, and miraculous things that are gonna happen in our lives tomorrow. We simply need to not worry about tomorrow. Well, how do we do that? It's not by trying harder. 
It's by becoming paschal, by becoming anti-fragile. In other words, it's by discovering that within us, in our baptism, we were given a gift. And that gift is simply this. Anytime you are harmed, anytime you are attacked, anytime you experience a death in your life, if you respond with faith, new life will spring forth from it. That is the Paschal mystery. The Paschal mystery is an ancient Christian thing. It's not a new idea, it's an old idea that's been forgotten. We only talk about it on Easter. But the Paschal mystery is that when things in Christ die, they will come back to life with greater power. This then seeps into all of our lives. So when you were baptized, you were given death. Did you know that you were given the death of Christ? But you were also given the life of Christ. So that for you as a believer, when you experience pain, anguish, death, loss, if you respond with faith, the promise is that the paschal life within you will spring forth into new life. This is what Jesus is talking about when he says John, in John chapter 12, verse 24, very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. He's talking about his own death there. Or in 2 Corinthians 7 through 12, the passage says, uh, but we have this treasure in jars of clay. Paul is talking to the church now. To show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. Do you know what that all-surpassing power is he's talking about there, by the way? In the first century church, they were healing the sick, raising the dead. They were prophesying. They were operating in the gifts of the Spirit, as well as great gifts of encouragement. The first century church didn't have the New Testament. Did you know that? They wrote the New Testament because of the all-surpassing power that was within them. So if you want that in your life, you can have it in your life, and this is the answer. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake. Why? So that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. What is he talking about there? The Paschal mystery. When you kill something that is in Christ, you only give it more life. You want to you know how to grow a, a church, how to make a church bigger? Make worshiping and gathering illegal. <laughs> you want to make a church thrive and have all surpassing power? Persecute it. Go after it. Hurt it. Harm it. Curse it. This is how believers grow is being pressed but not crushed, persecuted, not abandoned, and struck down but not destroyed. That is the amazing thing about the Paschal mystery. It is the life of Christ within us that when we, in our baptism, when we received this gift, we received something amazing. And that even when we die, we are given the life of Christ in our death. Isn't that amazing? If you don't know Christ, when you come to face the judgment seat of the Father, you will have to show him your resume. The good you did and the bad you did, and you'll be judged based on that. But if you are a believer, you show him Jesus' resume. You show him what Christ did on your behalf. So that he who knew no sin became sin, that we could be called what? The righteousness of God. I don't know about you. I don't want God to judge me based on my resume. I want to take, if I get to choose between my resume and Jesus' resume, I'm choosing Christ's resume. How about you? And that's precisely what it means to be saved. It means that the, the death in the life with, of Jesus is within us. But don't miss that. You can't have the life of Jesus without also embracing what? His death. Living within his death means living within his life. You take that paschal mystery. So I want you to know this. You are paschal. You are anti-fragile. 
the, the, the thing the enemy wants most in the life of believers is to keep them comfy. There is, rest is good, good meals are good, but we also must understand that in life it is the punches, it is trouble that makes us more like Jesus. It is pain, it is obstacles. As Marcus Aurelius said, fire feeds on obstacles. So does a believer. And this is precisely what it means to be Paschal or in Taleb's philosophy, anti-fragile. Now, I love uh, Taleb, who, by the way, is a Christian and loves to describe this idea as anti-fragile. And this is where we're gonna get a little academic. What does anti-fragile mean? So anti-fragile is like this. Imagine you had, um, this is what Taleb says, imagine you had a box of champagne glasses and you were going to mail them to your brother in New York City. You would put these expensive champagne glasses in a box, you'd tape it up real nice, and you would put maybe popcorn inside, and then you would write something on the side of the box to make sure it was handled with care. You would write fragile, right? And fragile usually means that the thing within the box is precious to you. It's probably expensive, but it's also delicate that if it's put on the bottom of a pile or if it's bumped the wrong way, that the things or all of the things inside could break and even become worthless. So that even though it's expensive and precious, it's also in, at risk of, of being destroyed. What is the opposite of that, by the way? Do you know? How would you answer? What was the opposite? Most people would get it wrong. Most people would say the opposite of fragile is something like resilient or robust. In other words, a box of bowling balls, for example, or a box of, uh, I don't know, footballs, or something that no matter how bad it got hit or beaten around or tossed, it'd be fine when it got there. But that is not the opposite of fragile. That's neutral. Like, what's the opposite of positive? The opposite of positive is not neutral. The opposite of positive is negative. So the opposite of fragile is not robust or resilient. The opposite of fragile is anti-fragile. That is to say, if you beat it up and toss it around, it'd get better, right? It'd get stronger. Somehow if champagne glasses, imagine they could be anti-fragile in a way, you'd want them to break because when they got there, there'd be somehow more glasses and they'd be prettier and worth more. In other words, your box would look like this. Anti-fragile, please mishandle. You know, it would be something in the box would get better if it were beaten up. It wouldn't merely stay the same. Taleb compares that to Hydra the snake, who, if you brushed up on your Greek myth, Hydra the snake was the fairy story creature that guards a lake. And he has three heads or four heads or five heads. But the idea is that every time you cut off one of his heads, two grow back. So that the more you attack Hydra, the stronger he gets. And this is the image of what it means to be anti-fragile. It's strong, powerful, and the only way to get an anti-fragile being defeated is to leave it alone, is to handle with care, is to make it comfortable. And of course, there's lots of things you know, that, that are anti-fragile both in myth and in real life. Of course, probably the most well-known anti-fragile character in American myth is the Incredible Hulk, right? I mean, everybody knows, you know, just... Once Hulk starts smashing, don't shoot him. Don't attack him, just leave him alone, sing him a lullaby. Hulk is the ultimate anti-fragile mythological character. You know, Hulk, Hulk, the better he gets, the stronger he gets. And recently in pop culture, one of the world's greatest rappers, famous rappers, Eminem, was criticized by another local, kind of no-name rapper named Machine Gun Kelly, a local rapper in, in Cleveland. And this rapper in Cleveland, Machine Gun Kelly, did, did a, like a diss video about Eminem and all this, and it, it kind of went viral on YouTube, but nobody had really ever heard of Machine Gun Kelly, and Eminem did the dumbest thing you can do to art you want to disappear. He criticized it. He responded with his own rap song, and of course, Machine Gun, you know, criticizing Machine Gun Kelly, trying to destroy him, and all he did was cut off the snakes of Hydra. Machine Gun Kelly's record went to number one on the billboard, overnight. 
See, this is what it means to be anti-fragile. Love is anti-fragile. If your daughter is dating a boy and you don't like him, the worst thing you can do for that love relationship is to help tell him, stop dating that boy, he's trouble, <laughs> right? It's anti-fragile, love is anti -fragile. The best thing you can do is to say, he's a sweet boy. <laughs> if you want to like break up with him, he's a sweet boy. You should see him more. When was the last time you called him? <laughs> That's how you destroy your teenager's relationship. You don't understand. It's, it's, it's just like putting a wet blanket on her. She's like, oh, do I like him? I don't know. I don't know. I was gonna talk about certain politicians that were anti-fragile, but my wife forbade me. All of this to simply say, all of this to simply say that good or evil, there are anti-fragile systems, there are anti-fragile people, and there are fragile systems and fragile people. The way to destroy a fragile thing is to attack it. The way to destroy an anti-fragile thing is to make it comfortable and to handle it with care. Do you understand? You are anti-fragile. And this is the antidote to worrying, is to understand that if bad things happen to you tomorrow, they're going to help you. This is what it means to be Paschal. Jesus Christ is the most anti-fragile being who has ever existed and ever will exist. Jesus Christ is the epitome of what it means to be anti-fragile. When they cursed him, when they said, lied about him, when they said that he was sent by demons, more people followed him, more people talked about him. The more they attacked him, the more popular he got, until finally they crucified him, which, as his enemies, was the worst thing you can do to Jesus, if you want to get rid of him. And through his death and resurrection, new life poured out into the universe. Everything changed. And in that moment, A.D. and B.C., time was snapped in two like a twig, one author said, in his, his death. Because that was the moment the grip of sin uh, began to lose its grip on your life and on my life. The cross, the cross is the ultimate anti-fragility that life came into our world through it. And we're so thankful for the obedience of Christ on the cross. Thank you, Jesus. And of course, the church inherited that paschal anti-fragility that the church in its inception was persecuted, enslaved, beaten, and it just spread like Greek fire. You watch, it's like in the first and second centuries of the church, when the Roman Empire enslaved Christians and, and like shipped them around Europe, they were just spreading Christianity around. They weren't destroying it. That's why Tertullian said the blood of martyrs is seed. That's why I said if you want to see a church grow, make it illegal. Persecute it. Throw Christians in jail. And you just see that the church will grow and thrive. I remember once there was a girl who was doing missionary work in China, and she came back to our, our old church to testify about what God was doing. This was in the 90s when it was pretty bad. And one of the great leaders of the underground church said to her, when she said, how can we pray for the church in China? She said, pray that China, that the government never stops persecuting us. We forget that it's trouble, it's the hardships, it's the punches that very often make us better. This is the cure to worrying, is to recognizing our anti-fragility. And that's very, very good news. You are so much stronger than you know because of Christ who lives in you. So if you want to grow in your anti-fragility and you want to worry less, here's four things in four minutes that you can do according to this philosophy, if it's true, that will change your life utterly. The first is this. If my friend Hydra the snake, you know, let's just imagine that Hydra the snake and I are good friends and Hydra comes over to my place and he's like, Bobby, man, I'm just so worried, man. I got all these Greek heroes are coming after me, bro. I don't know what I'm going to do. I've only got three heads. I'm worried, man. I got like 
Heracles and Odysseus and Achilles and Hercules, and they're all coming after me, man. I don't know what to do. I'll be like, Hydra, bro, go get a couple heads cut off right now. Go out there and pick a fight with someone before they get here. Go take a few punches. Go get stabbed a little bit so that you can go to bed with 19 heads <laughs> and uh, sleeve it off, you know? You're... It's like, uh, you know, um, myth, what is it called? Mithrodicism? What is it, the word? Mithridatism? Do you know that word? It's like when you take little bits of poison so that you become immune to the poison. That's how you stop worrying about poison. And that's how you stop worrying about life. So the first thing is uh, take some hits. Take some punches. If you haven't been, if you haven't taken little hits, little punches in a while, you, got, you just have to, it needs to be a rhythm in your life. You need to encounter things that hurt, that stretch, and that pull you so that you don't have three heads, you have 19 uh, when trouble comes. That's how you sleep well at night. Don't forget the rest part. There's an important part of a Christian and Jewish faith, the Sabbath. We have to have at least one day a week where we get a break from all of our uh, punches, huh? Number two, love your enemies. The world, in a way, says criticize your enemies, talk badly about your enemies, lie about your enemies, get them back, assassinate, drive by, hurt, harm. This is how most people in politics um, on both sides of the aisle act. This is not how Christians act. Christians love their enemies. You want to stop worrying about your enemies? Start loving them. Um, this is what Lincoln said, actually, when he said, I defeat my enemies by making them my friends. When you start to love your enemies, you practice what Dallas Willard called spiritual jujitsu. You use the harm that they have against you. This is Jesus, a core principle that Jesus taught us, to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. When you tip someone really well that gave you horrible service, when you say good things about your colleague that says bad things about you, when you're really heartbroken about your enemies and you pray for them and plead to God that he would turn their heart and change them and make them better, that's loving your enemies. And you'll watch how your worrying begins to go down and you become more anti-fragile and paschal. Number three, this is hard for religious people. Be vulnerable and humble. Stop pretending you're perfect. That's not helping anybody. When we... We don't have to be vulnerable, and hum we have to be humble around every everybody, but we don't need to be vulnerable about ar around everybody. Be vulnerable with your close friends and your family, with people you can trust. And be honest about the things you're wrestling with. When you are vulnerable, you become strong. That's what Jesus teaches us. He who, who tries to save his life will lose it, but he who gives his life up for my sake will save it, right? It's the opposite, it's upside down. If you wanna be strong, be vulnerable. If you want to be vulnerable and weak, be, try and pretend to be strong and tough and be a tough guy. Number four, finally, and the most important thing, you have to spend time with the master. If you want to conquer your worry and you want to become truly anti-fragile, you have to be a disciple. A disciple is someone who is disciplined. A disciple is a student. You have to be someone who spends time with the master, with Jesus, praying, thinking, reading, studying every day, that you, this is the most important thing any being can do to be happy, successful, overjoyed, and live eternal life is to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. To make that the most important, it's more important than your errands, it's more important than your job, that this is more important than going to the gym. If you have to choose between any of those things and being a disciple for some bizarre reason, you choose disciple. It is the most life-giving, most important thing. It is your oxygen. Prayer is oxygen. Without it, you will die spiritually. You, you need it to be alive. And, uh, and it's, it's, the more you do it, the more you want it because you see the fruit of what comes from that kind of life. I want you to know that you're stronger than you think you are. I want you to know that trouble is good for you, that comfort is bad for you if you have too much of it, and, and that the, the cure to worrying is to understand that God has made you an eternal being who is anti-fragile, that when harm is done to you, it's only gonna spring forth new life. I believe that with all my heart. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and we love you and we ask in Jesus' name that your Holy Spirit would fill our hearts and minds. Lord, that we would begin to walk in the all 
powerful gifts that you gave to the first century church and to Jesus Christ enjoyed, that we would see miracles in our workplace and in our family, that we would be in tune with the easy rhythms of grace. And Lord, we love you and we thank you. I just pray that everyone under the sound of my voice, that chains even now would begin to break in their lives. Lord, that they'd be given true freedom and insight and vision. And we ask for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hannah and I are so happy you've joined us in worship today. We hope that you've found incredible hope and inspiration from our program. Here at Shepherd's Grove and Hour of Power, we truly believe that we are better together. Regardless of where on this earth God has planted us, in Him we are a family. Bobby and I want you to know that we are so grateful for your generosity to our ministry. But it's not just our ministry, it's your ministry. And none of this would be possible without you. Because of you, people all around the world are being reached with the gospel every single week, and their lives are being changed forever. As we enter into another year of His goodness, we pray that you also know that you are part of God's family. You are a beloved child of God, united by His Spirit with brothers and sisters in every nation of the world. That's right. We want you to know that you're never alone, no matter what you're facing. God has the whole world in His hands. He loves you, and so do we. Today, Bobby and Hannah would love to send you this 2019 Hope Around the World wall calendar. Each month features a beautiful photo from the United States or a country where an Hour of Power office is located, like Canada, Hong Kong, Australia, New Zealand, the Netherlands, or Germany. Your calendar also includes monthly scriptures and inspiration, as well as powerful testimonies from members of both our national and international Hour of Power family. Large boxes for each day of the month, perfect for writing in appointments and events or the names of loved ones you want to pray for. Each day also includes a daily scripture reading to help you read through your Bible in one year. We want this 12-month calendar to remind you of how truly loved you are and how much we honor your partnership with this ministry. And with your gift of support today, we'll also include Bobby's brand new message series, Your Best is Yet to Come, on four CDs with our thanks. Or with a generous gift of $130 or more, you'll also receive a beautiful custom art display proclaiming your hope in Jesus. As we approach the year end, you're invited to make a special investment in the precious Word of God. With your special year-end gift of $1,000 or more, you'll also receive a very special leather-bound comparative study Bible that will take you deeper in God's Word. Call, write, or go online today and request your 2019 Hope Around the World wall calendar and four CD series, Your Best is Yet to Come. We're asking for a generous gift of any size. The preceding program was paid for by the ministry partners of the Hour of Power and viewers like you and is accredited by the Evangelical Council for Financial Accountability.